Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Wim and Christopher, and everyone else who has helped to, to put this together today. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, those clips were amazing, and I hope that uh, we'll build a discussion around uh, the issue of the old and the new Los Angeles. And I think that uh, Bunker Hill was one site uh, where the tension between the old and the new pivoted, uh, particularly during the post-World War II period. So that's, that's what I hope uh, we will get into today. Um, I have a few introductory remarks to kind of lay out the terms of, of today's discussion. Um, that are punctuated by a few questions that I hope will, will provoke discussion. Um, but before I, I, I get into our, uh, my comments and our discussion, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Um, following me, uh, Matt Roth uh, will come to the podium. And Matthew Roth manages the archives for the Automobile Club of Southern California. His publications include the major traffic street plan of 1924, infrastructure and the public relations of urban form, uh, which was published in Where Minds and Matters Meet Technology in California and the West, which was published by UC Press in 2012. Um, and he is author of other articles as well, published uh, in the Journal of Urban History, uh, and his PhD dissertation, dissertation from USC in 2007 was titled Concrete Utopia, the Development of Roads and Freeways in Los Angeles, 1910 to 1950. Following Matt, uh, we will have Catherine Gudis, uh, who is Associate Professor of History and the Director of the PhD Program in Public History at the University of California at Riverside. Uh, she is author of the book Byways, Billboards, Automobiles, and the American Cultural Landscape, in addition to many articles related to race and gender, civil liberties, and civil rights. Uh, currently, Kathy is curating two exhibitions. Uh, one is Junipero Serra and the Legacies of the California Missions, which opens in August at the Huntington Library. Uh, and the other is Geographies of Detention, from Guantanamo to the Golden Gulag, uh, which opens tomorrow at the uh, California Museum of Photography at, at UC Riverside. Um, last year, she was a scholar here at the Getty Research Institute, and next year, she'll be a fellow at Harvard's Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History to continue work on her next book, Curating the City, the Framing of Los Angeles. Following Kathy, uh, we're delighted to have Don Normark. Over the past 40 years, more than 10,000 of Don Normark's photographs have appeared in Sunset and other magazines, as well as in numerous books. Normark's award-winning photographs have been shown at the Brooklyn Museum, Friends of Photography Gallery, the Focus Gallery, and many reside in the permanent collections of the Brooklyn Museum, MIT, and the Smithsonian. Uh, his work is currently featured in Overdrive, LA Constructs the Future, 1940 to 1990, here at the Getty. Uh, and his coverage of the people of the Chavez Ravine was also exhibited at LACMA in 1950, alongside the work of Henry Carter Bresson, Dorothea Lange, and Wright Morris. Finally, uh, we will have Mark Langell, uh, speak, who was the team historian for the Los Angeles Dodgers. A member of the front office since 1994, Langell previously covered the ball club for the Pasadena Star News from 1989 to 1993. A graduate of Cal State Northridge, Langell has written five books about the Dodgers, and his television appearances include the Major League Baseball documentary, Cathedrals of the Game, Dodger Stadium, and ESPN's 30 for 30 production, Fernando Nation. So before our speakers come today uh, to uh, give their presentations, I'd like to just open up with a few ideas about the title of today's discussion, LA's Layered Built Environment. Um, what does that mean, the layered built environment? And what does that mean in the context of LA history in particular? Um, 
let me begin with an example of what I think LA's layered built environment means. Um, let's take the Los Angeles River as an example. Um, the river, as many of you know, used to be a river in the conventional sense of the term. Um, but during the 1930s, the river was channelized by the US Army Corps of Engineers as part of a flood control program. So we could think of that concrete channel, or what I call a concrete ditch, um, as kind of the first layering of the LA River. If we were to fast forward to the 1970s, um, we could look at the artistic intervention of the Chicana muralist Judy Baca, um, who created a, a, a linear panel of murals on a section of the concrete retaining wall of the Los Angeles River, um, which is a kind of narrative timeline of California and Los Angeles history told from the perspective of marginal social groups, including workers, women, Indians, African Americans, gays and lesbians, Mexican Americans. Um, and if you follow along this mural, it's in the um, San Fernando Valley in the Tahunga Wash portion of the Los Angeles River. Um, this is where you will find uh, the Great Wall of Los Angeles. That's the, the name um, of this timeline of California and Los Angeles history as told through muralism. Um, and we might think of this as a second layering over uh, the, the concrete channel that used to be the Los Angeles River. Now, if you were to look at one panel or one excerpt from this mural in particular, um, I think this brings us closer to, to our discussion today. Um, this is a section of the mural towards the end of the mural. It's called Division of the Barrios. And you can see from the image, it, it, it tells two stories. One is the story of the displacement enforced upon the residents of Boyle Heights and East Los Angeles through highway construction uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. And the other story on the right is the story of the Chavez Ravine and the displacement of the original Chavez Ravine community. Um, first for the proposed construction of a public housing program and then for the construction of Dodger Stadium. Um, so, so Baca, in her art through muralism, um, uses this concrete ditch that used to be the Los Angeles River as the site to tell an alternative story or an alternative history of California and Los Angeles. Um, and as a mural, it is a form of public art. That is, it's, it's not uh, within the rarefied realm of the museum, the gallery, uh, or even the university or the archive. And uh, interestingly, Baca herself describes the Great Wall um, as a tattoo on the scar of what used to be the Los Angeles River. So I think if we were to work from this particular image, we could then talk about sites like the Chavez Ravine then and now. Um, historically, the Chavez Ravine uh, was a poor working class community predominantly but not exclusively Mexican-American. It was a racially and ethnically diverse community. Um, it was also a tightly knit community of extended families, neighbors across generations, um, and it was a site where people knew each other and knew each other's families over the course of several generations. And it was a neighborhood characterized by a certain intimacy or familiarity uh, the very opposite of the kind of anonymous social relations that characterized historic and contemporary patterns of suburban sprawl and gated communities. In the 1940s, the Chavez Ravine was designated as the site for a proposed public housing project under the supervision of the City Housing Authority. In the early 1940s, 
1950s, the Housing Authority cleared the land in preparation for this particular housing project, uh, this vision of towers in the park that was sketched out by the architect Richard Neutra. Um, after the clearing of the land, by the mid-1950s, 1953, 1954, um, the public housing program came under attack by right-wing conservatives and Republicans uh, who took over City Hall in 1954 with the election of Norris Polson. And that year, uh, the new Republican mayor, Norris Polson, comes into City Hall and immediately cancels plans for public housing denouncing public housing as a socialist plot. Remember, this was the 1950s, uh, this was the height of the Red Scare, and red baiting was a successful tactic, um, particularly against uh, state programs like public housing in the 1950s. So Polson cancels the plans for public housing after the site had been mostly cleared uh, of its last remaining inhabitants. If we then fast forward to the late 1950s, um, that parcel of land was handed over by the city to Walter O'Malley and the Dodgers as kind of a bait to lure the Dodgers from Brooklyn to Los Angeles. Um, and upon acquiring that site, uh, the last remaining residents of the Chavez Ravine uh, were evicted from the premises to go forward with the construction of Dodger Stadium, leading to 1962 when the stadium finally opened. So the Chavez Ravine is, is, is one site where we can uh, talk about, and I hope we will talk about, the layering of LA's built environment. Another site, um, as we saw from those excellent clips this morning, um, was Bunker Hill. And we could also talk about Bunker Hill in a similar way of thinking about Bunker Hill then and now. As we saw from those fantastic clips, Bunker Hill was once the site of fashionable Victorian mansions uh, for the city's early elite that was based downtown. Yet by the 1930s, Bunker Hill was characterized as a tenement slum, uh, the site of the seedy romances of writers like John Fonte, or the noir murder mysteries of Raymond Chandler. There's a wonderfully evocative quote by Raymond Chandler um, from his story Red Wind in 1938 about Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill is old town, lost town, crook town. Once very long ago, it was the choice residential district of the city, and there are still standing a few of the jigsaw Gothic mansions with wide porches and walls covered with round end shingles and full corner bay windows with spindle turrets. They are all rooming housing now. Their parquet floors are scratched and worn through the once glossy finish, and the wide sweeping staircases are dark with time and generations of dirt. In the tall rooms, haggard landladies bicker with shifty tenants. On the wide, cool front porches, reaching their cracked shoes into the sun and staring at nothing, sit the old men with faces like lost battles. I think that you can uh, pair this evocative passage with uh, clips like the exiles that we just saw or uh, Dragnet to think about the old Bunker Hill versus the new Bunker Hill. Yet in the 1950s, all of this was raised by bulldozers through urban renewal grants from the federal government to clear away the seedy city, or the seedy remnants of Bunker Hill, to replace it with a shining temple of high culture. And again, we can think about uh, Bunker Hill then and now and the layering of the built environment uh, through these successive series of, of urban interventions. Um, finally, we could also talk about communities like Boyle Heights, then and now, also uh, on the immediate periphery of downtown Los Angeles, like the Chavez Ravine. Um, Boyle Heights underwent a similar transformation during the post-World War II. Like Bunker Hill, it was once the site of wealthy estates, the earliest suburbs for the city's gentry in the late 19th century. Yet by the 1920s and 1930s, the neighborhood had 
earned a more distinct working class flavor, a multiracial, multi-ethnic population uh, with a substantial Jewish population, but also Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Polish, German, Mexican, Italian, and African American residents all shared the space of Boyle Heights. And this was one of the city's first working class multicultural suburbs. In the 1940s and 1950s, this neighborhood also underwent a dramatic transformation. White flight depleted the neighborhood of its white ethnic population who moved to the west side or to the San Fernando Valley to the new suburban communities of the post-war period. And at the same time, greater numbers of Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans moved in, partly because of factors such as the displacement uh, of places like the Chavez Ravine, which, which created this kind of push factor uh, from Chavez Ravine to the east side, to uh, Boyle Heights. By the way, in, in my vocabulary, Boyle Heights is the east side, uh, not Silver Lake, as it seems to be fashionable in today's discourse of the city. But that seems to be increasingly subject to debate these days. Um, this, this process by which Boyle Heights became less diverse, less multi-ethnic, less multiracial, um, coincided with the onset of, this is an example of the Victorian mansions that uh, once uh, populated Boyle Heights, very much like, like Bunker Hill. Um, but by the 1950s, um, the onslaught of interstate highway construction um, radically transformed the built environment of Boyle Heights, um, ravaging what used to be this working class, multicultural, multiracial, neighborhood. Today, six of the region's major freeway arteries converge upon Boyle Heights, which is now the nation's largest Spanish-speaking barrio. And this introduced drastic changes to the landscape. I mean, if we were to look at one example in particular in Boyle Heights, we could look at Hollenbeck Park, um, which was once a, a fashionable refuge for the city's elite in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, but after 1956, that is after Congress passed the Interstate Highway Act, um, Boyle Heights shifted from this to this. Um, so now a visit to Hollenbeck Park entails a visit underneath uh, the belly of, of one of Southern California's largest freeway arteries. And I'm, I'm presenting all of this in the spirit of, of today's discussion. And I think that, that we need to ask these questions and I hope that we can get at this in our conversation today. Um, but what are we to make of these changes, these radical changes imposed upon the landscape? How do they reflect the different layers of history and culture in the city? How do they reflect the past, present, and future of Los Angeles? And I think that, that even more important, we need to ask um, were what were some of the larger structural processes that shaped these changes? And how did these structural processes play out um, within the locality of the urban built environment? These are some of the questions that I'd like to begin our discussion with. I think in one sense, we could walk away with a reassurance um, that this is progress, and this is how progress came to Los Angeles. And indeed, that discourse of progress, um, which is a powerful discourse in Western capitalist developed societies, um, that discourse of progress accompanied these bold interventions upon the urban built environment. Um, we could also call it modernization. And we could simply say, well, this was modernization in post-war LA, and this is what it looked like. But I think the fundamental question that we need to ask is what were the consequences of modernization? Who were the losers in the story, and who were the winners in the story. We could think about it in the case of Bunker Hill as well. Who were the losers in that story? And who were the losers, I mean, sorry, who were the winners in that story as well? 
So I think that those are some of the questions that I hope that we'll get at in, in today's conversation. I'd like to turn the podium over now to Matthew Roth. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Wim and Chris and Ronnie, for pulling this unique set of programs together. And I'd like to take just a few of my precious seconds uh, also to thank Jennifer Schmidt, who just showed me how to run the AV, and Sue Kang, who are uh, the premier event coordinators of all time. Thank you for making this very seamless for us. Um, <clears throat> Well, McCoy was talking about, uh, there was an article about the, uh, what became the San Bernardino Freeway, one of the uh, almost decade-long controversies in this first generation of freeway construction was in the city of El Monte, which didn't want the freeway there, and that was his response to you know, what do you think about the community protest? And the point I'm trying to make is that every freeway was born in controversy of some kind. And rather than a break in experience, I think this was actually a continuity because every major road project in Los Angeles met with ferocious opposition. And this dates from the very first plans for improved streets in the years before World War I. I want to make a distinction between broad comprehensive plans and broad totalizing characterizations of the city and the freeways versus the detailed route selection and structural design for a specific project. Okay? The city built for the freeway, the freeway we want to build in the city. Okay? Two very different ways of looking at this. Comprehensive freeway plans were a promotional device. They were meant to rally support in the face of the opposition that always existed. They were purposely vague on the specifics in order to avoid arousing site-specific protest. Uh, when you look at the, the, the maps of the freeway network proposed in the 1939 city plan and so forth, you know, they all show the metropolitan area on a basically eight and a half by 11 map, and if you actually scale out the lines of the freeways, they're you know, miles across. I mean, they, it, it's purposely vague, okay? And the reason is clear. I mean, there's no doubt that nobody has ever wanted to live next to a busy traffic artery. But at the same time, effective opposition against this kind of infrastructure has only mobilized once the maps were issued the maps that denote exactly which homes are going to be demolished, which neighborhoods are going to be transformed. <clears throat> Before the freeways, the largest arterial project in the city was the proposal to enlarge 10th Street into Olympic Boulevard. This was going to be a through route, 100 foot right away between the east and west boundaries of the city. Oops, I didn't advance. How about that? It was first proposed in 1931. This is a 1937 map showing the parts that haven't been, uh, where the, the land hasn't been acquired or the construction hasn't occurred. The ultimate design impacted about 11,000 properties across the city. Numerous pockets of protest emerged to oppose the idea. If you've ever driven down Olympic Boulevard and wonder why you have to curve at Country Club Drive, it's because they were avoiding a group of uh, obdurate uh, homeowners uh, with uh, money to hire lawyers. Uh, the project was actually canceled in 1926 when one of the many lawsuits against it reached the state Supreme Court, which decided against the plan. City engineers kept working on it. The revised route was presented to the city council for approval in 1932. The opponents advised the council to have loudspeakers mounted outside of city hall because they expected overflow crowds that would have to follow the proceedings from the sidewalk. And that turned out to be necessary because more than 6,000 people showed up to oppose the project. They shouted down the supporters of the plan. They cheered wildly for those who opposed it. City council members followed the will of a mobilized citizenry and the project lost on a unanimous vote. And Olympic Boulevard has actually never been completed according to this plan. And if someone 
wants to talk to me afterwards, I can tell you exactly the parts where it's not built out to its specific width and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the first two freeways that were actually proposed as freeways, which were the Santa Ana and the Hollywood, both elicited major protests, but the results played out differently on the east and west sides of the river. And I, this is a 1950 metro area map, and I you know, crayoned in the, the route of the Hollywood Freeway, the river, the Santa Ana Freeway, but I would rather show the map without the crayon because it shows portions of the route says dotted lines, and so I, this condition of uncertainty about the results is really where I want to take our imaginations for a moment. Um, these are the first freeways in Los Angeles that, <clears throat> did, that were not the enlargement of an existing right-of-way. Okay? They sliced across the grain of the urban fabric. They did not enlarge an existing route. Brand new right-of-way, important point. Now, in neither case did the opponents stop the freeways, but the protests did influence the designs of the actual structures that resulted, and probably more importantly, the subsequent administration of freeway construction. This is a map of the Santa Ana Freeway through Boyle Heights. It's an actual legal document. It was the appendix of the contract between the city of Los Angeles and the state of California that enabled the construction of the Santa Ana Freeway. And if it looks like something that your eighth grader brought home uh, after a geography project in middle school, um, well, I, I feel you. Um, it looks like a crayon drawing, and it really emphasizes um, the improvisational quality of freeway construction, particularly in this first generation. I don't mean to say that they were spontaneous, okay, but uh, they were not the orderly fulfillment of rational plans, okay? And... Um, is one of these a pointer, perhaps? There we go. I would like to point out right there. Now, north is at the left, so you have to kind of. Can you hear me if I walk over here? Yeah. Right here is where the East LA interchange is now, which is perhaps the most ferocious structure ever planted in an urban neighborhood. <clears throat> this is where the five and the 60 and the 10 all come together. I, th I think it occupies something like 27 acres, okay? and the retaining walls and the ramps you know, spread from there. Um, and yet, it's a blank spot on the map. Uh, <clears throat> partially, this was a purposeful omission. Partially, I think it reflects the uncertainty about how all this stuff is going to work, because they knew that some of these planned routes would have to meet approximately there, and in order to get the contract through, you know, they didn't know what it was going to look like. They said, well, the road's going to be the same on either side of this. So they just made, you know, a graphic ellipsis around that point. Uh, on the west side of the river, still a crayon. And you can see the reference to the 1939 statute that enabled freeway construction, which was actually the right, through a contract between municipal government and state government, to um, limit access from abutting property owners. That's the legal definition of a freeway, okay? Well, by some measures, the opposition on the east side was actually more effective, because um, once the state division of highways released the detailed routing plan, protest occurs. City threatened to rescind its agreement on the project, reopen negotiations with the state to change the design, and managed to eliminate half the planned ent entrance and exit ramps. Uh, they also forced the state to bridge more streets rather than just forcing them to dead end at the freeway. On the Hollywood Freeway, the protest forced a redesign at the outlet of Coanga Pass. Uh, it was a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, it replaced the planned tunnel with the massive flyover that transformed Franklin from a fashionable district seen on the bottom to what one opponent, in fact, the most effective opponent, the guy who dragged it out for a dozen years, called a forbidding dead zone. These protests also compelled the state to add pullouts for bus service at Vermont and Alvarado. 
But the broader impact of the Hollywood freeway protest was in the state legislature. Mayor Bowron, Bowron responded to these protests by pressuring the city's representatives in Sacramento to conduct hearings on what were called freeway evictions. And this was the main impulse behind the Collier Burns Act of 1947, which doubled the state tax on gasoline, primarily to fund relocation assistance for victims of urban freeway construction. Well, I'm sure my seven minutes has already expired, and this is clearly a much larger story than I can uh, tell right now. But in broad terms, I think that it is an example of the kind of classic opposition between structure and agency, in which non-elites, to a degree, are able to negotiate the terms of their ex exploitation, to a degree. Opposition to freeways was present at their origins and throughout the subsequent elaboration of the freeway network. A lot of the depictions of Los Angeles start with the idea, that, oh, horrible traffic, we have to fix it, consensus in favor of freeway construction, which then, in some massive pendulum shift, switches to rejection of that model of urban transportation and then into the era that we occupy today, the rail revival and so forth. And what I'm telling you is that the protest always existed, okay? Ever since there's been cars in cities, which is to say ever since there's been cars, because in their origins they were an urban phenomenon because that's where the money is. Ever since there's been cars in cities, the big think planners and engineers, the people who arrogate to themselves a totalizing vision of the city, have always wanted to build dedicated rights of way. 1907 plan for New York, 1909 plan for Chicago, you can go right down the list. For about a third of the 20th century, the balance shifted in favor of building these things. For two thirds of the 20th century, the reasons not to build them or the arguments against building them actually uh, reigned supreme. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, it was almost always a local concern, the opposition. Always specific to the impacts on particular properties, neighborhoods, and people. Comprehensive plans were intended to impose a different way of thinking about infrastructure. They were meant to impose a way of thinking in terms of a broader common good rather than in terms of the interests of a few property owners. And of course, it's probably familiar to you all today because this mode of discourse is very current, typically framed as NIMBY, right? Uh, or not in my backyard, which is a pejorative, which is applied to those who would halt major infrastructure development to serve what is purported to be their own narrow ends. I think that NIMBY is not a description of a situation. NIMBY is a point of view. It is a way of looking. It is the centralized versus the particular, the vernacular. It's the panopticon, if you will, the panopticon view. Highway opposition was never preemptive, hardly ever preemptive. It surfaced in response to specific projects and the threats they represented. And this automatically creates an imbalance of small local interests fighting against the plans of those charged with serving the region as a whole, or the city as a whole. Highway opposition was omnipresent, but it was inchoate. It was not organized or institutionalized, at least not on the same time schedule. It was a reaction to detailed plans. And this lack of a comprehensively articulated position has caused this opposition to fade from our historical picture of Los Angeles. Surely that picture must change when it includes the spectacle of 6,000 people descending on City Hall in March of 1932 to protest Olympic Boulevard. This constructed image of Los Angeles as the city built for the car has always been more prescriptive than descriptive. There were plenty of cars, but not much in the way of infrastructure built to accommodate them. And this disparity 
survives down to the present time. These depictions declaring an automotive metropolis are a collection of assertions that were intended to mobilize opinion in favor of a goal that would remain tantalizingly out of reach. Thank you. Hi. Well, when I first was told that we had five minutes and that I was to discuss downtown, I thought, well, maybe I should write a haiku. All right, so I spent, I literally spent weeks trying to come up with a haiku because in fact a haiku is the perfect form for talking about something like a landscape, right? And to talk about ideas of landscape and to think about some of the juxtapositions and some of the ironies and some of the ways in which that set of juxtapositions might help you have an interiority to understand what you're looking at, right? In other words, to give you another mode of perception. And so I admit that I failed miserably at writing a haiku so my presentation will be a little bit longer. Um, uh, but, but really, I, I think that what I want to get at with this is that uh, part of my interest is in um, coming up with, as, as I think Eric, Eric so, so beautifully laid out, the ways in which the, the past, um, the present, and the future are layers of landscape. And that we would do well at this moment in time, and especially with so many different architecture shows going on around town through Pacific Standard Time Presents, to really think about how we put those layers back together again and how we can kind of unseat maybe some of the master narratives and maybe do so through those smaller histories or historical narratives of the losers, right? And I actually think that saying it that way is really, is really useful and instrumental, so I hope we can continue that discussion. Um, and I want to also um, just say that um, I, 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 I'm working on a project that goes under the name Curating the City, which is a name that I have shamelessly stolen from the Los Angeles Conservancy, um, and is the name of a series of programs that they've been doing in which they really are framing the city in order to help us understand it a little bit more and to see those layers that have contributed to its making. And I mention this because a few weeks ago, as part of Pacific Standard Time Presents, and I hope you appreciate that I'm you know, pitching all of your programs here, but I went to a fantastic program on Bunker Hill that the Conservancy did with, with as, as part of this Getty set of programs. And I really can't even pretend to come near to what Don Spivak, who had worked for the CRA for his entire career, basically, and, and the career of development on Bunker Hill had to say. So I'll just steal a few lines from him instead. I think that's instrumental. But I want to start first by showing this image, which I want to explain a little bit, because it's um, it actually, I think, has I, I think there was a little, um, a little piece of this that was in the dragnet, maybe, of one of those pools of water, maybe had a, had a cameo in that dragnet clip. But this is um, Garrett Ekbo's beautiful um, landscape outside of Union Bank Plaza at Fifth, Fifth and Figueroa. And I think that in a lot of ways, it's the perfect embodiment of um, this, this modern vision for Bunker Hill, right? And it's a contemporary view, contemporary to basically, I would say, 2011, when I went on a wonderful tour, which offers another sort of artistic layer on top of this built environment to help us sort of see through some interventions what's going on to shape the urban environment. And this particular intervention was with an artist collective called the Los Angeles Urban Rangers, who as part of a MOCA engagement party, held a series of um, urban landscape tours, if you will, um, through Bunker Hill. And so what you're seeing actually framing this image is, um, is from the elevator. Um, of the Bonaventure Hotel, where you can go up in the different elevators which take, lead you and direct you as if compass points to north, south, east, and west parts of the city. And so I'm looking down upon this wonderful, um, you know, designed three acres of paved ground that can be accessed not from the street, but fr from a series of stairways that you have to ascend or descend from, and a tunnel, um, a pedestrian overpass that you might get to from Bunker, uh, from uh, the Bonaventure. All of which is to say that this is a public space that is essentially private. And I want to focus on that a little bit today in thinking about Bunker Hill and also thinking about some of the clips you looked at and the ways in which we might understand public space in the face of 
this sort of sets of layerings in a place like both Bunker Hill and downtown. Um, and I admit that I do have, you know, a larger purpose in, in, in showing images and talking about this, which is that I, in part, also want to look at a landscape like this where we see no people. We do see cars. We do see a very um, a beautiful sculptural scene, one that was intended by ECBO and developers to be seen, in part, by Union Bank employees from the upper stories of the 40-story building there, right? And so, in part, it's about um, uh, both a fortress LA, which Mike Davis, of course, talks about, and Eric Avila also discussed. And, and, and made references to, as well as a kind of surveillance that's taking place. And part of this LA Urban Rangers tour actually included counting the number of surveillance cameras as you made your way around Bunker Hill, up the corporate mountains, and across the meadows, this being a meadow, of course. Okay, so this is a contemporary view, but, but, but when we think about, and I, you know, I want to just go back, back one second. I, I'm showing this also because I have a really deep and abiding interest in the ideas of, um, of of preserving modern architecture. And when I think about that, I want to add those layers that Eric and Matt and I know our other speakers are going to talk about, which is that of, of, of the social stories that inform the built environment. So how do we take an environment like this, which we might honor architecturally, and see as a beautiful plan and actually appreciate aesthetically whether it's in an image or if you make your way there or can make your way there um, and you belong there, in other words, you're not kicked out because it is treated as private space, um, that we can kind of save this as a beautiful icon of modernization, but also use it for its darker underside. How do we actually tell some of the stories of the displacement of people through the preservation of a site like this? So that's in part what I'm interested in. Can we think of this um, as a way of preserving um, stories about urban redevelopment, right? Can we think about this as maybe, you know, conserving modern architecture, but also maybe trying to attach a series of um, stories about the, the, the losers, those people who aren't welcomed here and were displaced from these grounds. And so we look at that previous image and there aren't very many people. And in fact, when you look at some of the surveys and the architectural photographs that were part of the survey process that the city undertook, both through the housing authority and then also through the, um, the CRA, um, redevelopment Agency, um, the top two um, from the Gettys collection, and those are Leonard Nadell photographs, and I was very excited when these made their way um, uh, digitally. They're all, they're all available, and there are a lot of them, and they are incredible documents of Bunker Hill, of the different parts around downtown, as it undergoes a dramatic set of changes in the post-war period. But what I also noticed was that they do show you lots of the scenes, like for instance, that scene is in the exiles, right? You can see it straight out of the exiles. But this one is barren of people. And again, my, my concern here is how do we put people and how do we put the, the power back into the stories of architecture? architectural history and preservation, right? You know, how do we um, acknowledge the power dynamics that took us from this to that other image, right, that of structured development? Um, and in thinking about how we might use these images almost to curate the city, to draw our attention to the city again in its layers, um, how do we endow those who basically lost out and, and this kind of view with a, a cultural legitimacy that would be similar to the pristine images of, of these beautiful architectural spaces that we see now. Um, so these are some of the things that I'm, I, I'm interested in, in looking at um, some of the ways in which we can preserve the, these past histories, and some of them are, are through architectural photography, like those by Leonard Nadell. I also show this image on the bottom, which is um, from the CRA, which um, is great because it illustrates the ways in which um, Bunker Hill was basically raised. And so many people, when they talk about different cultural concepts of how we understand landscape, they oftentimes talk about storyscape, right? The fact that there might be a natural contour that you can attach age-old stories to that give you a sense of your place in the world or even may help orient you geographically, right? But what happens when you actually shear off the top of a hillside, right? It's, it's, a, it's a very um, symbolic um, means of really shearing a set of memories, all right? And so I, I, I think this image is really illustrative of that, especially because it also shows two houses being moved from Bunker Hill to Heritage Square, where they ultimately 
ultimately will succumb to arson, and, and so they, they, they don't actually um, last any longer. It also suggests the ways in which these small-scale structures become displaced in favor of large-scale and ultimately, almost entirely in the early decades, commercial development of downtown. Now, the standard story for what happens here that is still repeated, and it's about Bunker Hill, it's about uh, downtown, it's about places like MacArthur Park, one of my favorite places, um, is that, um, you know, in the 30s, you know, there was, you know, no investment in um, in 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 the physical structures, um, and I see I've already like gone too long, I think, which is too bad. <laughs> I should have written the haiku. All right, um, but the standard line is that that there's no investment during the depression in the physical in the physical structures, right, um, into physical stock, and that in the post-war period, with you know defense industry spending, we have better income, and in the post-war years, there's abundance, and so there's a mass migration. So the line is that. Bunker Hill and these other sites, um, it, it's about abandonment. Abandonment of many neighborhoods as people flocked to the suburbs, right? But were they really abandoned? There were people living there. There were only some people who, some people abandoned these places, but not all people. So in fact, when you look through some of the um, architectural records, it's very difficult to find the people, but they're there, and there is some footage that's also on the DVD for, the, the set of DVDs for the exiles, which includes some other rare footage showing Bunker Hill as this place where children of different colors are playing together in their front yards, right? In which there are these interactions that are crossing front yards that don't have fences between them, or they're traversing the steps up and down Bunker Hill, or they're walking down to the street and taking, you know, they may not have had the penny to put it into, um, you know, Angel's Flight to go back up. But it's showing that, in fact, these weren't abandoned places. They were places where people of low income, in some cases deeply impoverished, in, in, in some cases those migratory workers who might stay in one of these converted um, tenement homes for a short period of time, high number of Filipinos, high number of people who were returnees from Japanese internment camps, and a high number of gay and lesbian folks for whom this was an attachment to a physical space that was right down the hill at Pershing Square, which was quite well known um, as, um, sorry, as um, a site of cruising and where you might be able to, um, you know, connect with people where you weren't, weren't welcome elsewhere. And so we can easily see that though this is a truncated contour of a physical landscape, right, there are still these stories that can be connected to them. Um, one vibrant set of stories that actually include people, and moreover, Native American people, is from the exiles. And this is really significant, and I hope that it's discussed by Tom Anderson this afternoon. I think he's speaking this afternoon? Am I drive that wrong? Yeah. Um, this was um, something that was really brought to public light as part of L.A. Plays itself, and the film is really fantastic because it shows a very important epic in LA history and really national history and really plays a role in Bunker Hill because it's about the displacement of a group of people um, on so many levels. Bunker Hill was an area that housed many Native Americans. The film highlights this. They were here because in the 1950s, as part of a Cold War containment policy, as well as you know, a, a desire perhaps to disband reservations as potentially communistic if you want to take it in the really harshest way, there was a policy of um, of you know, trying to relocate Indians from reservations and moving them into cities. So we had a huge influx of Native Americans into downtown, including reloc relocation offices in downtown. So when Bunker Hill is erased, it's also displacing people who have historically been displaced over and over again. All right? So I think this is a really important element of the story of Bunker Hill, that the layers are about um, a continuation of movement of people and that this is a place of diaspora. There are many people who are crisscrossing this area of downtown because they literally have been moved from one place to another over and again. And again, this works for those different population groups that I mentioned, mentioned already, including Japanese um, people returning from internment camps, which is, you know, I think, shocking in many levels. And again, the Filipino connection, I'm making it more than I would have because I just found this really fantastic information about this. And it's, it's very poignant because Little Manila was at first in Maine, gets displaced by another moment of urban renewal projects, right? Also living in Bunker Hill, displaced. Move, moves over to temple, displaced, right? So we lose this whole place of collective memory for many different population groups when Bunker Hill transforms in the way it does. Yet still, this street here is, um, and, and you know, some of the scenes from the exiles suggest that there are rich stories and that there still are landscapes we might connect these stories to. Um, 
And you know, certainly we can see some of the contours or see tunnels and sort of get this back, get this sense back. And as I mentioned, you know, Pershing Square as another place that in this same period of the post-war um, is another example of how urban renewal was in conjunction with the targeting by police of all different kinds of populations, right, who didn't fit, right? And here it's a targeting by police um, of prostitution and homosexuality, right? Um, it's a social containment, a wiping out of vice. And this is happening at Bunker Hill, Pershing Square, and through these other sites of downtown. So some of those noirish scenes of the uh, paddy wagon taking people away are in part um, you know, related to this kind of picking people up, not just the drunks off the streets and the paddy wagons, right? Um, it's, um, so there's a dramatic reconfiguring of one of the city's most historic neighborhoods here, and a dramatic assault on public expressions of, of sexual non-heteronormativity. Non-hetero, um, so this is part of the story of post-war economic expansion, right? It's not that a place was abandoned. People were actually living here and and crossing paths here. It's about another exclusion. Um, It also signals the way that moral geographies are constructed by policing and also by urban redevelopment, which I think is important to insert here. Um, It's an exercise in spatial power. Um, And it's no surprise that um, that the quarantining quarantining queer sexuality would be here, right? Um, Because this is also where other people are displaced. Okay, Um, okay, so let me move on quickly here because I realize I'm taking too much time. I think this is significant on another level, which I alluded to already, that um, people might have been gathering in Bunker Hill or children playing on the steps going up um, you know, to the tenements in Bunker Hill. But I think we need to think of these spaces, even though these structures don't exist any longer, as, again, multi-layered spaces and also multi-layered spaces of potential collective memory. We may not hold those first-hand memories ourselves, but if we share those stories, we can have the remnants of them. We can have it as second-hand memories. It can still be a, collect- a space of collective memory, which I think I'd like to talk about a little bit more in the context of conserving modern architecture as well. Okay, so this again is like an alternative history of the city um, inscribed by subjects whose communities are under siege. Okay, Um, all right. Now, I mentioned before the LA Urban Rangers, so I want to just put this contemporary layer on top of this, which is to say that what they are seeking to do is to, um, to address the idea of public space as not necessarily being public, and they do it in a tongue-in-cheek fashion, right, um, in terms of dressing up as rangers, because rangers are friendly, and they give you information, right, and there's nothing threatening about them, and they can tell you, take you up to the peaks, right, and they can tell you about, you know, the, the microclimates that are there, and I think this is one strategy of public intervention that can enable us to see something that we might not otherwise see, which I think is part of this idea of the layered environment. Um, here we are crossing some meadows, and we also see signs as we go along the way that um, the, the spaces that you might imagine are public might not be, and the spaces that you think should be public really aren't, right, that they're, they're privatized. So this is an important issue. Um, I, I was going to talk a little bit about Skid Road down the street. If you want to think about where people went from Bunker Hill, whether they were Native Americans or the elderly or the Japanese American elderly who were displaced when Bunker Hill was, was raised, oftentimes they moved down the hill and into Center City, into Center City East, oftentimes into the area that still remains that's called Skid Road. This was one mode of trying to wipe out some of the same housing stock further into um, into Center City East or um, adjacent to what we have call Skid Row today until there was a recognition that the poor people were actually causing bigger problems elsewhere and making satellite Skid Rows, and that was a problem. So a system of containment was developed and one that actually involved many members of the community down at Center City East and in the Skid Row area who were social service providers and who actually were able to outline a, an area of social services that would be pr- provided that had a de facto way of also retaining some of the housing stock. So today we still have some remnants of them. These are all buildings that are still extant that show that there's, again, a a layering of history and of these historic structures that almost forms a parallel to Bunker Hill, right? Is this our Bunker Hill now? Is this something that will be wiped out instead of by urban renewal by forces of gentrification and attempts to clean up those impoverished who we no longer wish to have in our public view, which was what happened at Bunker Hill. And so I'm kind of interested in some of the strategies of other artists like another group called the Los Angeles Poverty Department who takes performative actions, exhibitions in gallery spaces and compiles stories of people through oral narratives and oral histories and represents them, reenacts those small histories of losers on the streets of the city, in essence, reclaiming the right to that public space. Um, and so with this image, I think I'll, um, I'll, I'll conclude and um, just suggest that, um, again, um, 
I think some of these projects are about our larger rights to the city, no matter who we are, right? Whether we're spectators who live elsewhere or not. Um, and maybe we can think about um, how we can bring attention again to these lost histories, especially of marginalized pe people. Um, and we really do need to consider these multi-layered multi fundamental ways in which cities are designed. Um, it's through people and their movement, right? It's not just through architectural uh, forces, it's through poverty, it's through gentrification, through configurations of brick and mortar, whose shape might have been guided by architects and owners, but whose meanings over time have been influenced by use and a huge range of other social actors. Thank you. Everyone has talked about the, uh, the grand schemes of architecture and freeways and, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, I'd like to give a little more intimate glimpse. The slides I'm going to be showing, um, there are two groups. The major group was made in 1949 in Chavez Ravine, and then a, followed by a smaller group uh, made in, uh, at 41st and Alameda, the, the farmer's gardens that were there for a few years. Um, the architecture and freeways that fill Los Angeles are all made by people to serve people. I assume the future city of Los Angeles will change as the people change. And I think the, the slides I'm showing tell the story of one important change that is underway among the citizenry of Los Angeles. These slides will just play and I'll... Uh, in 1949, I stumbled on Chavez Ravine and spent six months photographing the people and the place whenever I could. I wanted pictures of life, pictures that told stories, and pictures I carried out of my darkroom felt like success to me. The people of Chavez Ravine lived in my photographs. They still live. Many have become friends in recent years during the making of the book and the film. The book was published 50 years after I made the photographs. 50 years, well, the gods of social change milled their way to destiny. I'd like to read from my book a few quotes from the people who recall in more intimate detail their lives in Chavez Ravine. Gilbert Hernandez said that his grandfather tried three times to come into California. He came to El Paso, Juarez, and crossed Arizona, but he couldn't make it. It was too far, a bad desert. Then Nogales, desert again. Finally, he came through Mexicali, the Salton Sea, Calexico. Mexicali was just a dinky border town, and Palm Springs was nothing. There was a wagon trail which they traveled on through San Bernardino to Colton. They came on horseback with a wagon. Oops, sorry. Um, in 1911, they got to Los Angeles and found some land in the Chavez Ravine. The lots were on Brooks Avenue in La Loma. My uncle Domingo built a house there. My grandfather built a house. And then my tío Candelario and my tía Natalia came. My oldest daughter was born at 1716, and my other daughters were born right on the corner across the street. My wife, Tepi, was born in the same block. Zeke Contreras said, there was only one road coming in from Bishop, from Broadway, Bishop Road that went into Elysian Park. My grandfather and some of the early immigrants cut into the hill to make Effie Street so they could go down into our valley. The Lost Colonies, people called it, because nobody knew the valley was there. We walked all the way to Broadway to shop. My dad and I would go to Third Street Market to buy groceries. We'd catch the streetcar and carry the food up to the hill where we lived. We did not have paved streets, just dirt roads, sidewalks made out of wood. The Westlake family owned a brickyard. A lot of the local people worked for them. When Dodger Stadium, where Dodger Stadium is situated now, part of that hill where they built the bleachers was already excavated. That's where many, for many years they dug 
out of the, uh, dug out the adobe to make brick. Los Angeles was paved with brick. A lot of it came from Chavez Ravine. Tony Montez said, those houses were small. When they had parties, they'd put the furniture out in the backyard. There were parties every Saturday night almost. My dad taught me to play the bass when I was about nine. When I played at parties with him, he paid me my share. We had the bass, two guitars, a fiddle, and a sax. We played boleros, cumbayas, sometimes waltzes, border music, popular stuff. We played all the time, and they paid us. Not much, but there was always stuff to eat. The women would be making tamales, menudo, pozole, everything. They put powder on the floor so you could dance. Floors were rough, wide boards. Nobody could afford linoleum. People there that weren't invited would stay out on the porch to talk and hear the music. Gilbert Hernandez, you'd see artists painting in the neighborhoods on weekends. My father-in-law was a gardener and I worked with him in the 40s. He worked for some movie stars. We did Alan Ladd's garden, William Bendix's, and J. Carol Nash's. At one of the houses we took care of, the lady invited us in for coffee. She had a painting of my aunt's house on her wall. They added landscape, but it was my aunt's house. She said she bought it at an art gallery. And Mike Vasquez said, after those agents came around, I told my mother like this. I said, Ma, they are going to take us anyway, and they are giving us $10,000 right now, so the best thing to do is to sell, because otherwise they're threatening us. You will not get what we are offering now. They were a bunch of, excuse the word, son of a bitches, because for the simple reason that they were not very nice about everything. The farmer's gardens I, I suppose you know some of the history of the place that uh, was uh, the city bought the, li the land by right of eminent domain um, it was 14 acres they were going to build an incineration plant here that got voted down the city had this land they turned it over to the food bank which happened to be adjacent to the land the food bank fenced it and opened it. Whoops. Did I turn that off or did it there? Thank you. Just, will it just stay there? So the people uh, gardened the place for about 14 years. And then they were uh, um, told to leave. They were being evicted. Well, but they said uh, they weren't leaving. They said, aquí nos estamos, estamos en no nos vamos. Um, in Chavez Ravine, the people owned the land. And when they were told to leave, they um, left. But here, uh, several decades later, what the people didn't own the land. They were just using it by generosity of the city. But when they were told to leave, they said, no, we're not leaving. Because uh, in, in those years, uh, uh, strength had built within the Latino community, and they realized they could have some control over their destiny in the, within the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Before I begin the uh, uh, background about the Dodgers, I should clear up 
Uh, whenever I give a presentation and people hear my title, I feel that I have to explain it because you don't normally hear the phrase team historian. And so the question, how do you become a team historian, is actually very easy. If you don't hit the ball in Little League, you're well on your way to being a team historian. <laughs> so at age seven, I knew I couldn't play, but I was always very interested in the Dodgers, in baseball, and reading and learning all about the team, I never knew about Chavez Ravine until reading something other than necessarily a baseball book. And so later when you discover everything that went on behind the scenes on both coasts and everything like that, you realize that it took a perfect storm for the Dodgers to come to the West Coast. And when they arrived, they had no idea where they landed. Uh, this is the 100th anniversary of the opening of Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. And the Dodgers joined the National League in 1890. And like any franchise, roller coaster, good years, bad years, and Ebbets Field was built in a neighborhood. And at the end of World War II, Walter O'Malley, who was a vice president with the club at the time, decided, well, he needs a new ballpark. There was only space for 300 automobiles. And he really was the first of his peers to look at baseball as a business. And all so many different things had to occur for the Dodgers to come here. Uh, first, you had to negotiate with the city of New York and Robert Moses, who was in charge of the planning and of all the urban projects. And those were two strong-willed personalities. And for 10 years, they went back and forth. And one year, they, won the, they got to the World Series in 1953. And on the cover of the 1954 yearbook is an image of the Brooklyn bum dreaming of a new ballpark in Brooklyn. And finally, uh, O'Malley decides, well, maybe there needs to be a plan B. Maybe Brooklyn is not going to work out. And so right around the time of the 1956 World Series, he seriously considers Los Angeles as an option. But several things have to happen. Uh, Pacific Coast League Baseball was popular here. And uh, Phil Wrigley, the owner of the Chicago Cubs, owned the territorial rights. So Walter had to secure not only a bargaining chip for the territorial rights, but he had to purchase the franchise, the PCL franchise, the Los Angeles Angels, uh, who played here along with the uh, Hollywood stars. Bob Cobb, who owned the, the uh, Brown Derby restaurant, uh, he had permission from Phil Wrigley to play here. So it was Wrigley the key as far as if a major league team was going to play here. But then O'Malley also had to convince the longtime rival Giants to come to the West Coast as well. And one of the bargaining chips for the Giants was the concept of pay TV. And so the Dodgers win the World Series in 1955. The Giants have just won it in 1954. And suddenly by 1956, they're in the World Series, but they've got their eye on other places just in case it doesn't work out in Brooklyn. So from the end of the 1956 World Series, the Dodgers purchase the PCL franchise and then they have serious talks with New York. Is this going to happen or not? They sell Ebbets Field. The Giants did not. They owned the uh, polo grounds, but they did not own the land. And so there was no incentive for the city of New York to do any improvements to the Giants ballpark. And they were going to move to Minneapolis. And O'Malley tells Horace Stoneham, the owner, if you're moving to Minneapolis, we're going to lose the Dodgers-Giants rivalry. Why not come to the West Coast? And along the time politically in New York, while you had Robert Moses being a roadblock, uh, you basically had a group of eager young politicians, uh, the mayor, Rosalind Wyman, and Kenny Hahn, who decided that baseball would make major league, uh, big league for Los Angeles. And so it was a different political climate, and the negotiations began in 1957 as far as the land goes. October the 7th. It's decided that the LA City Council is finally going to take their vote, and the principals involved aren't necessarily sure that they've got the 10 votes. Roz Wyman tells the story that she couldn't tell O'Malley that she didn't have the 10 votes, and she also couldn't tell the other council members that O'Malley wasn't necessarily committing to Los Angeles. And finally, they make the vote. It's 10 to 4. The next day, the Dodgers announce that they're going to come to Los Angeles. A couple weeks later, they board a charter, and they come, and they land at LAX. And along with the pomp and circumstance and the parades and everything like that, a gentleman came up to Walter O'Malley with a summons. 
and that was just the first shot. Then there was a petition, uh, there were referendum and everything like that. So on that plane ride, when they landed, if they thought the journey had ended, this 10-year quest to find a new ballpark, a new home, uh, actually it had just begun. Thank you. Great. Well, those were fantastic presentations. Thank you, everyone. I think our time for discussion is maybe a little more limited than what we would have liked, but nonetheless, I think we can uh, engage in, in a substantive conversation. It seems like there was a lot of overlap in our, in our conversations. And hopefully, um, after about maybe 20, 25 minutes, we can invite a couple of questions from the audience as well. Um, I'd like to just open up with, with one question. We um, just heard from Mark and we heard from Don, but um, I was telling Don before um, our presentations today that I use many of his photographs in my classroom. Um, when I teach the history of Los Angeles, there's a big section on Dodger Stadium and the Chavez Ravine. Um, so my students know Don's photographs very well, but I, I can't help but resist. I, I have to ask you, Don, when you look at Dodger Stadium, what do you see? When I look at Dodger Stadium yes. now? Yes. Um, a big funnel. Uh, a big funnel, that looks like, that took everything away. The, the people who uh, were evicted and who made way for Dodger Stadium, um, every one of them's got a, their navel is buried under, uh, the, there's a, a Mexican tradition to, for the, for the mother to, to bury the child's navel in some special spot, and, the, the, and uh, navel cord, I mean. Uh, and so everyone from the ravine had a naval cord buried under home plate or, or first base or somewhere like that. So that was that was that was the only positive memory, positive uh, response to the stadium. So your mind immediately goes to the community that used to be there that yeah. that was displaced. When I first came back, uh, I made the photographs in 1949. I left Los Angeles, went home to Seattle, then on to. Uh, New York and Europe, and it was many years, it was, I don't know, 15 years or so before I got back to Los Angeles. And I had, it was here on assignment, and I had a rental car, and I went looking for the community. I thought I'd go, you know, visit. And I kept running into Dodger Stadium. Um, and I thought it was just something dumb about me, because always before I'd gone by streetcar and walked, so I hadn't ever gone there by automobile before. I thought it was me. The next day I had an assignment to photograph the home garden of Garrett Ekpo. I told him of my difficulty in finding the old uh, neighborhoods in Chavez Ravine. And he said, he told me the story. He had been the architect, landscape designer chosen to do the landscaping at the low cost housing in Chavez Ravine. So it was all a revelation to me. Wow. In, in my own work on Dodger Stadium in the Chavez Ravine, I, I'm, I'm struck by just how powerful the Dodgers have become as a symbol of Los Angeles. And I guess one of the questions that I grapple with in, in my own work on this issue is, what would Los Angeles be without the Dodgers? I mean, um, the team is so central to the identity of the city. And I think part of what, what is important to understand is that um, taking the Dodgers from New York City and bringing them to L.A. in the 1950s, precisely at the moment when L.A. stepped onto the world stage as a modern metropolis. Um, this was the same decade that, that LAX opened and, and whatnot. I think that kind of underscores just what a coup it was for Los Angeles. And yet... Mark, you had mentioned that, that the city council vote on the, the contract to bring the Dodgers was 10 to 4. So it, it wasn't unanimous. There were... No, it was by no means a slam dunk. And when you think of what might have been, uh, the St. Louis Browns could have moved here after the 1941 season. And the American League was set to ratify that. And Pearl Harbor came along. And they weren't able to move. 
and in 1956, the Washington Senators were thinking of coming here. And so we see Dodger Stadium with a privately financed ballpark, and that hadn't been done since 1923. But then you say, well, would it have been the same if, let's say, the Washington Senators came to Los Angeles and played at that small ballpark at Wrigley Field? Would it still have had the impact? And if they weren't as successful on the field, would you have the impact? Because they got lucky in the second year, they win the championship, and suddenly you've got World Series games with crowds of more than 90,000 for all three games. All right. Now, Wrigley Field was... Do you know it? it was at 42nd and Avalon, and okay. there was uh, Los Angeles Angels played there, and uh -huh. Gilmore Field was the home of the Hollywood Stars. But Wrigley Field only had a seating capacity of 22,000. And when the Angels played for the first time in 1961 as members of the American League, they played there, and then the Angels played from 62 to 65, but they wouldn't call it Dodger Stadium. They didn't mm -hmm. want to give the Dodgers any advertising. So if you have a program or a ticket, it was always see the Angels at Chavez Ravine. 42nd and Avalon is uh, a block east of, oh, excuse me, a block west of uh, the Central Avenue uh, Cultural District that we know in our day as uh, the place where uh, the African-American jazz artists congregated and R&B artists congregated. <clears throat> and uh, when we did the, uh, we did an exhibition on the landscapes of South Central Los Angeles with the uh, California African-American Museum. And there was a strong re-photography element to that show. And so we're going around trying to reconstruct uh, landscapes and um, you know, at, at, uh, at uh, Central and, and Slauson you have the site of what had been, before it was demolished, the largest tire plant in North America. Huge employment. You have this whole cultural district extending up Central Avenue. You have what was a major league ballpark a block away. And you get this sense of this you know, vast metropolis of, of South Los Angeles, which, so far as I know, hasn't been mentioned at all today. And that's why I jumped in to say it. South Los Angeles, or what we used to call South Central Los Angeles, is actually an industrial city or a former industrial city of 500,000 people. It's Cleveland, okay? And, uh, I mean, in effect, it's Cleveland. Uh, and it's just, you know, hung on to, you know, it's kind of Baja Bunker Hill, if you will. Uh, and uh, this ballpark was a critical part of understanding that because, yeah, for sure, major leaguers played here. This was uh, a, a diverse, lively, viable community based on industrial employment. And when we're talking about uh, ghost communities and uh, uh, the, uh, the voices that have been lost uh, to our perception of Los Angeles history, we have to find a place for South Los Angeles. Well, that was certainly Edward Roybal's question in his opposition. He was on the city council, um, and he was one of the four votes against the, what was known as the City Dodger contract. And he was also recognized as the first Mexican-American um, in city government since the end of the Mexican era in the mid-19th uh, century after the American conquest. But one of Roy Ball's questions that he kept coming back to was, why not Wrigley Field? Why can't we have the Dodgers in Wrigley Field? Um, and, and throughout the discussion, my sense is that there was absolutely no consideration of Wrigley Field as a possibility for landing the Dodgers. It had to be in the Chavez Ravine, um, which, if you think about what was happening to downtown at the time, it made perfect sense. You anchor the city by bringing its heftiest cultural institutions within the immediate core of the city. Don. Uh they took O'Malley on a, on a helicopter tour of Los Angeles and pointing out the sites. And when he saw that, that uh, Chavez Ravine with the freeways adjacent, he said, I mean, if, we, if that's what you want to give me, I'll take, I'll take it. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I don't think that we should discount the role of freeways in this story as well, because it was partly you know, the centrality of Chavez Ravine where all the freeways intersect um, that uh, made O'Malley even, even more um, 
enthusiastic about, about this particular site. Having lived in Echo Park for 10 years, I know what Dodger Stadium traffic does <laughs> to the neighborhood, um, and it, it can be a disaster sometimes, but um, that's neither here nor there. Uh, but I think that there are other dimensions to the story. Um, when, I, when I teach this episode in the history of LA to my history class, um, I talk a lot about the displacement, um, the consequences. This is when I show your photographs, Don. Um, but if I teach it in another context, for example, in the context of my Chicano studies courses, um, my students are very prepared to understand your photographs as a symbol of a lost community, of the consequences of building uh, Dodger Stadium. Um, but then I show them a photograph of Fernando Valenzuela. And suddenly the, the nodding stops. <laughs> and they don't quite know what to make of this dimension of the story, the fact that uh, Mexican Americans have embraced the Dodgers from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, in, what comes to your mind, Mark, about the I relationship think, between the team and the larger Mexican-American community of LA? I think with the entire community, uh, since 1901, the Dodger franchise set a record in terms of highest cumulative attendance. And so both Brooklyn and Los Angeles, when you have a franchise, it can mean so many things to so many different people. And by playing over a six month period, it really becomes ingrained in your lifestyle. And so it's not just an abstract building where you don't know what is conducted, it's being played out. And when players come from different uh, countries and you're able to root and suddenly you may identify with a certain favorite player, uh, it, it becomes emotional. It's not just the big unmarked building that you don't know uh, what happens. And so when you have championships, when you have suddenly a Fernando mania emerge uh, in these famous storylines, um, it, it, it's a little different than a freeway or a type of business uh, that people can't talk about because of baseball. You may not be necessarily a fan or an expert, but you, know, you can know generally so you can assimilate into a conversation with other people as far as you generally know how the team is doing and you can identify with people. And that's why it's emotional. And ironically, with the 100 years of Ebbets Field, there's still people in Brooklyn that mourn the loss of Ebbets Field and the Dodgers and them leaving. And so with a bi-coastal history, it goes both ways because you have the celebration of both coasts, but you still have a segment of people in Brooklyn that are still mad because we left, and there's still a local segment that's mad because we came. Mm -hmm. And then you have a large segment that's just happy to follow a team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't mean to... to completely dwell on the Dodgers throughout this conversation, but Can I ask absolutely. A I, you know, I actually had a question, because in your film, in, in the film that in, includes your work, right, right. The, you, um, you're in touch with um, families right. from then, and so what is their response to the Dodgers today? Uh, well, it varies, absolutely. Right. I mean, some people, Dodger fans, and other people won't even look at the stadium. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes mm -hmm. them ill, so, mm -hmm. so it's both ways. Have you ever heard the expression, sal si puedes? Oh yes, it was, yeah. It was in the book, uh, one, of, one of the women that I was interviewing said, you know, said to someone else uh, as I was there, said, I don't know how Don did it uh, coming and going with his camera like that, because it was sal si puedes, get out if you can. You know? right. uh, I, and then she said, I guess we weren't as bad as I thought. You know? <laughs> It, Sal si puedes translates to leave if you can or go if you can, and it's kind of a, an informal nickname that uh, many residents of a barrio will call a barrio Sal si puedes, get out if you can, and it's kind of a wry or ironic uh, awareness that this should not be your home, this is not where you should be, and yet at the same time, your Correct. photographs so beautifully evoke the attachment to place, the connections um, that developed over time. So there's a, a tension here that, that I think uh, deserves recognition. But Salsi Puedes was also a threat. It so was. Don't come into my neighborhood. Yeah. E exactly. Yeah. That's very true. Um, let's talk a little bit about downtown. I mean, downtown today is, is 
nothing like downtown 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and in thinking about things like Dodger Stadium, Bunker Hill, highway construction, I guess one of the questions that I always grapple with as a historian is, is did it work? I mean, did, did the plans for the reinvention of downtown Los Angeles work? In hindsight, would the movers and the shakers of the 1950s uh, take satisfaction from their work? Would they pat themselves on the back by saying the job was done right, we were correct in our assessment, and it, this had to be done? Uh, I'm sorry. sorry. Well, you know, it's interesting because it's taken almost 50 years, right, to you know, try and get to the completion in some way of the Bunker Hill plans. And so 50 years later, um, in this presentation a few weeks ago, um, Don, Don Spivak, a planner, con had a concluding slide, and I wish that I was good enough with numbers to remember, but he, you know, categorically called it a success because when Bunker Hill redevelopment was sort of in, in the works, it, I think the statistic he offered was that it cost the city nine times what it got out of Bunker Hill because the cost of social services and other things was so high and there was no tax base. And that today there's a huge tax base. And in that regard, he was really trumpeting it as, you know, as a huge success, even though ideas about how one should handle neighborhoods and, and community ha have shifted, which he, he also acknowledged. Um, so I, I found that to be a refreshing response, in fact, mm -hmm. because it, it had an answer, and it was numerical. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, what do you think? What about the freeways? Do we need those interchanges in East Los Angeles? Did, did they have to be there? Was that part of the downtown strategy, or? Uh, I think that the, uh, uh, there's no doubt that East Los Angeles bears a disproportionate uh, cost for, uh, of freeway construction, not just the East LA interchange, but um, the San Bernardino split, which is just east of the Aliso Viaduct, and, the, and then the various freeways that connect to them. But I think that um, in terms of the relationship to downtown and East Los Angeles as the place where unwanted municipal functions Go. I think that as soon, as, you know, when Boyle Heights ceased to become a retreat for the well-to-do with the mansions on the hill, which really begins right around 1920 or so, right? I think at that time, East Los Angeles becomes the repository for what's unwanted in the city, and I very much include the unwanted people because, you know, that list that of uh, of, uh, of, of ethnic and racial groups that Eric uh, uh, talked about in his introductory remarks, uh, East Los Angeles was one of the few places in the 1920s that did not have the racial covenants in the deeds, okay? And this, you know, just like the blank spot on the map, this is a very pointed omission, okay? It says that the unwanted people, the undesirables go here. I think one of the key factors in uh, East Los Angeles, Boyle Heights, uh, becoming the repository for you know, unwanted municipal functions is actually the Blue Diamond Pit. It was the largest garbage dump in the city and also early 1920s, completely un, uh, unstudied. Uh, it's now, it was basically where wa north of Washington on the east side of the river and it's now paved over truck depot. Uh, <laughs> But it was, not, it was the largest garbage dump in California. It was the largest incinerator west of the Mississippi River. It was um, a foul, foul, foul place. So now, as far as the freeways go, uh, you know, this early period that I discussed uh, in relation to Olympic Boulevard, when it was literally impossible to build a road in Los Angeles, uh, you had city engineers trying to deal with local traffic problems. You had state engineers who were charged with building through highways. And the main route between San Diego and San Francisco, uh, now more or less the five, they built it right up to the edge, right up to the eastern boundary of the city, Whittier Boulevard, what becomes Whittier Boulevard, and stopped. 
And they knew what the politics of transportation were in the city because you know, the structural engineer for the State Division of Highways and the structural engineer for the city of Los Angeles were brothers. They lived in the same house, and I'm pretty sure they knew. I'm pretty sure that one quarterly you said to the other quarterly, "Oh, you're never going to get a highway through here." <laughs> but they, they 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 left this traffic pouring into Los Angeles, and and I mean, I feel a little bit like that old Sonny Boy Williamson song, "Don't stop me to talk, and I'll tell you everything <laughs> I know." But. Uh, what that did is it established this very awkward pattern of north-south uh, uh, transportation through the city. And uh, <clears throat> as other arteries developed, they all pointed there. And the, the thing about East Los Angeles, it wasn't necessarily, okay, let's, it wasn't always, let's put the stuff we don't want anywhere else there. But that was certainly a big part of it. But to me, the most important thing is that it was always... Uh, the repository for decisions that weren't yet made. You know, we can't figure out how to do this, but you know, we'll keep it away from downtown and we'll figure out how to do it in East LA. And so it was, a lot of it was path of least resistance. I think, you know, if we uh, ever kind of gathered up the census data on um, owner occupant, owner occupied housing, I think we might find that the most important variable is um, absentee landlords versus homeowners. Because, uh, I mean, the folks uh, in what we now call Mid Cities area that you know, uh, were able to elicit the kind of political reaction to the Hollywood Freeway that caused all these big policy changes, they were white. Anglo middle class homeowners who had direct access to Mayor Bowron. And I know that for the one or two blocks that I've looked at uh, in Boyle Heights, we had like a 70% rate of absentee landlordship. You know, it was this very diverse ethnic community at the time. I think, you know, the, the mobilization of Chicano political power and the flowering of uh, Chicano cultural expression, you know, comes later. Mm -hmm. And I think that. The, the, cult, the, the prominence of, of freeways as, as, as a trope in this, in this expression has more to do with that flowering uh, than necessarily with the, the spatial aspects. And you know, I'm gonna stop talking now, but if I was gonna continue, I'd start comparing the impact of freeways on African-American community in South LA versus East LA, because it's very different. Very different indeed. Kathy, do you wanna? Chime in. Well, you know, I think as, I, as you were talking, I was, I was kind of thinking about some of the industrial areas, in particular, you know, South Los Angeles, and I was drawn to what you were showing from South Central Farms mm -hmm. um, and the ways in which it, it seemed to mark a pivot point for you, yeah. right? And, um, and that, you know, it's a green space with, you know, and th there's an aerial view of that, of that space, which, you know, just, I, I couldn't help but think of this, com like, odd set of comparisons that you elicited between O'Malley going, you know, having an aerial view and choosing Trevez Ravine, and then when we see an aerial view, say in the film on the farm about the farm, you know, you can see that it's this, you know, pocket yeah. in, in this larger, this larger expanse, and you could see the way that arena has been so dramatically cut off um, and so industrialized, you know, and that there are these different modes of infrastructure that have created that, including the LA River, which you so aptly included in the beginning, mm -hmm. that it's its own, you know, um, concrete. It's a concrete river that you know, has its own it, it, a metaphorical association, but also serves you know, as a way of defining um, that, that arena as well. But yeah, I was very taken with that, that comparison. Great. We, we have just a little bit of time left, but if there's maybe one or two questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Well, I thank you all for a really wonderful overview of the issues that you, you brought up today. I, I wanted to just bookend that with an observation that I heard yesterday from um, David Martin, who is one of the big developers or the firms that did a lot of big development downtown. And he had a very interesting story. He said, well, when I was an architecture student in 1966, we used to go over to Bunker Hill, and we'd go there at night, and we'd knock on the doors, and no one would answer. Well, there was no one there. And I, some time ago, had a, um, gave a presentation at the LA Public Library, and Councilman Tom LaBonge, 
I was talking about Bunker Hill, and afterwards he came up and he said, well, you know, that was a, a very dangerous neighborhood. And so I guess the point I wanted, the, the question I wanted to ask all of you, are you talking to the right people? Are they listening to these stories? Because I think that they're, you know, these kinds of discussions should be happening at the California Club and other places where these decisions are actually being made. And with this history, are we learning anything? I mean, are we learning anything that's going to really change what has already happened? And I guess that's my question. Well, if you can get us an invitation to the California Club, <laughs> I'd be happy to have this conversation. I think most of us would probably agree. <laughs> For the right price. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I'd like to just chime in quickly. I, I, I think that's actually really interesting, and I think that the LA River does end up serving a, a role here, because I think it exemplifies the ways in which, and we've had this conversation before around exhibitions, I think it exemplifies um, the ways in which there are grassroots activists and other people who are interested in the ways, historians and others who've brought attention to the development of the river, who have then become activists, who have then gotten the ear of, of public bodies, so to speak, and become part of that policy-making organization. And so I think that there's a nice parallel there, and that there are shifting notions of planning, and David Martin would probably agree. It might not change the way he seeks to construct the tallest building in Los Angeles, just you know, um, where, the, where the Grand Hotel is on, uh, on Wilshire. But uh, you know, he, he, he's heard this and shares the sentiment in some ways. You know. it didn't change his mind, no, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I would actually beg to differ in using that L.A. River example and maybe also thinking about freeway planning and the way that there has been a changing way of trying to understand even Bunker Hill and trying to create, and Dodger Stadium, right, put back public transit as a means of knitting the communities back together from a, a, you know, a, a transit perspective, at least. So I think we're in a significant place right now in thinking about that very question. When I was... Uh... Uh, when I made the Chavez Ravine photographs, and was, I made a little handmade book uh, dry mounting the page, photographs back to back and a spiral binding it and all. And from the, at the time that I was near the end of the time that I was working on, just from conversations around with friends and strangers, and, and then when I started showing my little book around, I really got kind of discouraged and I thought, well, I'm just preaching to the choir, you know. The, only people interested in this stuff are people that are interested in this stuff. Um, so at the time that may have been true, but I, I mean history is, uh, you know, now it's history and it's, it's useful. So uh, what, we're, what we're doing right now may not be uh, particularly uh, changing in things, but we're a start or we're, we're somewhat part of the process at, at, at any rate. Um, I I'm involved uh, with a, a community organization in Watts, and through that, uh, uh, oddly enough, was representing the community in a master planning process for uh, Central Avenue in 2007 and 2008, uh, from 103rd to Imperial, you know, the, the, the main corridor of, of Watts, main commercial corridor today of Watts. And there's, Compton Creek runs west side, kind of a cur <coughs> curving alignment on the west side of Central, and it makes the lots very narrow, and it's, you know, channelized. It's a mini version of the L.A. River, and of course it's a dump and, a, and so forth. And in the course of this master plan, I mean, there was a team of architects and landscape architects and so forth, and there were so many different city agencies that had to be touched in order to... Um, you know, determine the feasibility of, of these different things. You know, it was a lot, a lot, a lot of meetings. And, and the idea of, you know, greening Compton Creek and making these uh, three blocks of properties on the west side of Central Avenue actually be waterfront property really caught fire. <coughs> um, uh, everyone, the, the people who live in Watts liked it when it was presented to them. And so, you know, we go into the meeting with, I think it was DWP and City Public Works, thinking that, you know, it was going to be another one of those things of, uh, you know, the neighborhood, you know, the neighborhood desires, you know, crashing against the, the, the fortress of suits. 
And uh, the guy from uh, Public Works says, oh yeah, well we got some money to, you know, to do that, you know, to uh, improve drainage by removing concrete and we can allocate a little bit of this over to here. And, and DWP said, well, you know, we got some money that's budgeted for uh, local projects to take uh, overhead power lines and, and, and subsurface them and so forth. And I mean, I walked out of that 45 minute meeting thinking, well, okay, the world has changed a little bit because the policies, you know, ha uh, some have been made, they have been articulated, they are you know, getting down into the agency level, and I think the only thing that prevented waterfront property from appearing in Watts today is the recession, which stilled the entire project. Great. I, I wish we had time for more questions, <coughs> but unfortunately our time is up. But I want to thank all of our panelists for a wonderful presentation today, and thank you all for coming. It's great. Thank you.